so um, we did get some feedback earlier today that uh, people were having trouble hearing, so I'm asking everyone, including board members, healthcare advocate, and the hospitals, uh, to please speak right into the mic and speak loudly and clearly. Um, at this point, if the court reporter could swear in the witnesses. Uh, please raise your right hand. Do you swear the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So much Thank you. And whenever you're ready, I see. Um, so, my name is uh, Tom Frank. I am the Chief Operating Officer for North Country Hospital and currently serving as the Interim Chief Executive Officer. Uh, to my right is Andre Vissonette, our Chief Financial Officer. And to my left is Abel Cochran, our VP of Patient Services. Uh, we have some guests with us today. Tracy Paul is our Executive Director of Finance and Accountable Care. Uh, Wendy Franklin is our Development Officer. Uh, we have uh, Anita Flagg is our controller. Amy Jo Morris is one of our accountants. And our special guest is uh, Gary Gillespie. He's a member of our Board of Trustees. So thank you folks for coming. Uh, before we kick it off, I just want to thank the folks who've had a chance to come up to visit North Country Hospital. We really appreciate you guys doing that. And for those who haven't had a chance, we certainly would love to see some more people come up and visit us up in Newport. And that would go for the advocates as well. If you've never been to Sarah Hospital, we'd love to have you. We're pretty proud of our little hospital. Um, so I think, um, as you all know, we're located up in Newport, um, where we have a service area of about 30,000 folks. We have the most uh, isolated hospital in the state of Vermont, uh, highest poverty rate, lowest health status. Uh, and what's also very challenging for us is we're 45 minutes to the nearest critical access hospital and two hours from the nearest tertiary, and that is on a good day. Uh, the 2018 uh, county health rankings for Orleans and Essex counties, uh, unfortunately, rank last in the block by health factors again this year. Uh, you can see 13 and 14, Orleans and Essex. Uh, 2018 County Health Ranking is Orleans ranked last in Vermont for health outcomes, quality of life, four to fair health, four phys physical health days, four mental health days, and low birth weights. So as you can see, we have some uh, challenging folks that we're trying to do our best to take care of up there in the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, just a quick overview of our structure. We're actually North Country Health Systems, Inc. And under that, we have our hospital, 25-bed clinical access. We have a 23 bed nursing home, and we're in a uh, collaborative uh, limited liability corporation, NBRH, Northeast Kingdom Healthcare, where we provide sleep services and we're expanding to some pulmonary services as well. Andre? Uh, one of the questions that uh, we are asked every year is, uh, you know, we submit our projections initially back in uh, July 1st, which are built in April and May, and as we go through the summer, those projections folding. Uh, for 2018, our projected uh, operating gain was $694,000 as submitted. Uh, through May year-to-date, uh, our operating gain is actually at 392000 positive. The budget is um, so year to date, May, our net revenues are actually down slightly, 347000 So as we built our 2019 budget back in uh, April and May, we built it at a $958,000 operating gain. Based on those uh, other four uh, items, I would say that currently our projections are holding um, throughout the summer. Of course, we still have a couple months left. So our hospital issues, risks, and opportunities. Uh, increased volumes associated with mental health issues and opioid use. I'm sure that that's a very common theme throughout the state of Vermont, so I'm going to show that's something that uh, you guys hear uh, quite regularly. Uh, one of the things that we're doing to address uh, the mental health issue, especially in our emergency department, is we're building three specific rooms for our mental health patients to be held in a safe environment. Um, Ava, you might want to jump in here, because um, you know we have quite a bit of uh, we have quite a bit of problems with trying to care for these folks in our emergency room along with our other patients. We have an incredibly busy emergency room, referring back to the fact we're so far from another hospital. Um, so that's something that we're investing in and we'll talk about that in capital. Uh, ability to recruit and retain workforce. This right now is, is one of our number one issues that we have. 
Um, our market pressures on compensation are only going to increase with other factors that are going on in the state. Um, you know, last year we lost about $2 million on our bottom line, so we had to take some very hard and make some very difficult decisions, and, and one of those was to hold the line on salary increases for staff. All that does is it gets us a short-term gain for a long-term pain, and we needed to increase what we were able to do with folks because we were beginning to lose quality staff. Uh, we also had to make some market adjustments this year, which, which contributed to um, an increase in what we were able to pay to try to hold on to these folks. Um, also, based on where we're located, limited availability of qualified staff. So there are times that we might have to overpay for a particular specialty, um, a clinical person, in order to get those folks in the door. It's also it's very difficult to recruit from within our East Kingdom. Uh, ability to maintain positive margins for reinvestment into the organization. As I said last year, we lost about $2 million. This year we have a, a positive, we hope to hit budget, which is $650,000, I believe, under. Um, and next year we're at 950. That's just about a 1% margin. And those dollars do get reinvested directly into the organization and equipment and services. Continued increase in the regulatory pressures at federal and state levels. Um, the variability in our dish payments from the state. You know, the constant threat of 340B going away. Um, there's talk of critical access status potentially being in jeopardy as well. All those factors uh, can contribute to, to what we consider, obviously, a significant risk. Uh, and then additional resources required for population health. We are in the middle of changing from reactive to proactive care. Um, and obviously, when you do that, um, that that's going to lead to some additional FTEs and additional cost association making that happen. And we'll talk more about that in upcoming slides. Okay. One of our largest initiatives, and probably the largest initiative the hospital can go through is uh, converting its electronic health record. This year, we went live with Athena Health on May 15th. Uh, we took really four disparate EHRs and merged them into one. Um, that was uh, organizational-wide. Uh, at the same time, we also converted our accounting system. Um, there is probably no easier way to level a pain playing field than do it doing something like that organization wide. So that is we, we put that up, up there as both a risk and an opportunity. Uh, we look at Athena Health as a huge opportunity. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that Athena does is it's cloud-based. So part of the risk is it's really more of an opportunity. It's moving costs from what was traditionally a capital structure to an operational structure. So you're paying service fees instead of depreciation. Um, we're anticipating efficiencies out of Athena, both from the, the software itself, as well as changing our processes to make them more efficient. Um, so we're looking at process improvement efficiencies, uh, building and collecting efficiencies. So looking at um, you know, reducing dollars that are actually going to be, we're not increasing volumes, we're just collecting what we should be getting collect, what we should be collecting from each of our payers. Uh, and in the long run, hoping to reduce FTEs through attrition, um, through these, these efficiencies. Um, every time we try to look for uh, reducing FTEs, it's either because somebody uh, left to go someplace else, or if they're looking to retire, and we just wouldn't be replacing those positions. Uh, we continue to evaluate and implement new staffing models. Uh, our current one that we're looking at right now is our med surge and ICU, which we're looking to um, change that. The, the patient flow and the process on that, so it's all one floor, but it was divided by a wall, basically. Um, and merging those into one area and almost having convertible rooms so we can uh, gain more efficiency through our staff and better patient care as well. Uh, we participated in New England Alliance for a Health Group Person Collaborative, it's NIA. Um, we're increasing compliance around 340B and cost reduction opportunities. One of the things we've done this year is we've actually put in the budget an additional FTE to help us with 340B compliance. Because every year, um, they ratchet up the compliance efforts uh, from the federal end to see if they can reduce their payout of 340B. But also looking for better contract opportunities uh, with pharmacy contracts. Even if it's one drug, uh, it can save you some money. Uh, and then we've been doing this and continue to uh, look at financial and op operational evaluation of all of our services. That's difficult to do from a critical access hospital standpoint, but it's something uh, that we need to do look at our service lines at that moment so we can see which areas are actually costing us a lot of money, which areas are making money, which areas are breaking even, 
and just do an evaluation of that. Major budget, budget initiatives. Uh, evaluate Medicaid risk contract under One Care Vermont. We've been in the Medicaid component of One Care for the last year, and we anticipate on staying with that one more year as well. Um, we are just starting to sort of get in the flow of how that's working from a fund, funds flow perspective, what we need to meet the expectations for being in just the Medicaid, uh, and we're actually hiring an additional FT to help us work um, with the uh, One Care folks. Uh, as Andre mentioned, implement Athena Health uh, EHR. That is that has the potential to really, really help our organization uh, immensely, both with quality and financially. Uh, unlike uh, most. Uh, Unlike most vendors, um, Athena Health is more of a partner than a vendor. We don't cut them a check for $3 million and pray that we uh, have an EMR that works. They, uh, we don't pay them unless we collect the money. So they've been working with us for about a year to implement, and we just cut the first check to Athena last week. So we really do consider it a partnership. We have a ways to go, but we're getting there. One of the key things from our perspective financially, I think if you read uh, the news, you see that when folks switch over to an EMR, there's the real opportunity for them to lose significant dollars the first year or so that they're under uh, a new EHR. Two months in with Athena, uh, we were at 80% of our cash collection goal. So we have high hopes that we're gonna be able to work very closely with these folks and they're gonna help us turn things around. One of the things Andre mentioned was the opportunity from an FTE perspective. Um, the first slide I showed you today showed that we were the most wired. Uh, we weren't received an award for the most wired. So I consider that both a blessing and a curse. Um, we have an extremely expensive uh, IT model that we had in place prior to us looking to the cloud. Um, over the last year and a half, two years that we've decided to make the change to Athena, we've lost five individuals out of our IT department purely through attrition and not replaced one of those positions. Uh, improved population health data infrastructure that goes hand in hand with Athena and our ability to produce quality reports. Uh, evaluate population health, uh, medical home organization structure and resources. Um, and that's one thing that we continue to look at on a regular basis. Uh, develop strategy to mitigate financial risk, uh, reserves, i.e., reinsurance, et cetera. Those are some of the things that we're looking to do. Access. Um, one of the questions was with respect to third next available appointment. We only look at that on an as-needed basis. We don't look at that on a regular basis. Um, the key for us in primary care right now, because that's the area obviously where most organizations have a struggle getting patients in the door, um, we're still able to see most of our patients can make same-day appointments. Um, we have a model that I'll talk about later on in the slides. We've changed complete delivery of care and primary care to a team-based model versus simply a doctor sort of sitting in quote unquote alone off and trying to do their own thing. So more to come on that. Um, one of the things that we're really seeing in the Northeast Kingdom is the continuous, continuing retirement of physicians. Uh, over the last two years, we've had two more community primary care providers retire. At this point in time, that means that 98% of the physicians in the Northeast Kingdom are employed by the hospital. The APM quality measures, uh, there's uh, 13 of them. Eight of these measures, this is one of the questions, eight of the measures uh, we either met or exceeded uh, the Vermont statewide rate. Uh, the ones that we exceeded were the percentage of Medicaid ad adolescents with welfare visits, 30 day follow up after discharge from mental health, uh, diabetes, HbA1c, poor control, appropriate <coughs> asthma medication management, percentage of adults reporting they have usual primary care provider, as Tom just mentioned, prevalence of chronic care disease, HDN, deaths related to drug overdose and rate of growth in number of mental health and substance use related ED visits. The slide that we did not meet, um, initiation of alcohol and drug dependence treatment and engagement of alcohol and drug dependence treatment. Those two, we actually had gotten a grant for uh, alcohol treatment last year and we actually moved that grant over to the Northeast Kingdom uh, Learning Services, and they have initiated a relatively new program with that grant money to help um, address this problem. Avery, <coughs> which part of that? For which part? The, uh, the whole service of the Northeast Kingdom Learning Services. 
there were, I mean, we're, we're partnering with a lot of folks in our area, Northeast Community Services, the recovery um, groups, um, some of the um, independents in the area that work on behavioral health and substance abuse and looking towards um, prevention measures. Um, part of, uh, in a slide later on, I'll talk about the Upper Northeast Kingdom Community Coalition and um, they're also looking at how we address um, mental illness and substance abuse issues within our area. Then we have uh, prevalence of chronic disease, COPD and diabetes. Um, and number per 100,000 population, ages 18 to 64, uh, receive medication assistance treatment. Uh, on the last one, we have one physician that is now certified for the um, medication assistance treatment and two more mm -hmm. that are getting certified. Once all three of them are certified, uh, they're gonna really start engaging with this program. All-payer model. Uh, as I said, we're entering the second year of the Medicaid only, and we have seen some significant positive uh, developments out of that. Uh, obviously, one is predictable payment. Uh, two is proactive versus reactive care. As I said, that's what we're transitioning into. Um, potential upside risk. And collab being the, uh, having the ability to collaborate with other hospitals even more so than we already do. Those are some significant upsides. Some of the unknowns and possible concerns. Um, as I said, we've dipped our toes into Medicaid, but we're, we're, not, we're not quite ready to jump in all three yet. Um, the, course of, the cost of supporting one care infrastructure, this year we have available about $300,000 um, just to support the infrastructure of being in Medicaid. Um, increased cost of supporting the reporting and care requirements. Um, you know, right now we're going to have two systems that we're going to be entering all our information into. That requires bodies to be able to do that. There isn't one simple way to do it. And as I said, we're, at, we're adding an FTE there. And it being a small player uh, and influence downside risk. I think besides Porter, we were the only critical access hospital that actually dipped our toes into the ACO this past year. Um, so having the ability to influence the overall downside risk um, when we are the smallest hospital uh, is something that we are obviously a little concerned about. Now, I'm ready to go on. Uh, so from financial slides, I, I took um, the you met here more uh, technical staff files, the analysis. Uh, one of the things I want to point out is from 2016 to 18, if you look at our NPR growth, it averages about one and a half percent. The growth from set from 18 to 19 is slightly under the Screen Mount Care Board's guidance at 3.1 percent. And the bottom line, um, as Tom mentioned, uh, we lost almost just under two million dollars in 2017. Our Budget this year was 694,000. Our projection was at 950, and our budget next year is at 950. And as we went through um, whether our projections are holding for this year, um, I, I feel confident that they are. Um, I think we're in a good place, and we actually have almost a $3 million turnaround is uh, quite substantial. The other thing is, uh, yeah, just a second. On other operating expenses, there was a question as to um, what was driving some of that? Well, a big part of that change is the Athena health costs ending up in the bad line as opposed to uh, the capital. So we have been historically averaging about $1.6 million a year in capital expense for IT. Next year's capital expense in IT is about $600,000. So we've been able to cut that in better than half. Uh, but we obviously are going to see a transition to operating. Uh, the significant expense drivers in our budget next year, uh, compensation and benefits, uh, as with everybody. Uh, locums and travelers, uh, we have been flow with this. At some times we can brag that we have no travelers, and other times, you know, two months later, we can have six travelers uh, with some attrition of particularly nursing staff and some of our other professional staff. Uh, and then our EHR capital property costs. Those are the, the three significant drivers in our our financials. Uh, another question uh, that came up uh, through this process was our bad debt and free care. Uh, this is a slide that uh, I've shown before uh, at this presentation. Over the years, uh, our bad debt and free care, I looked at them combined. So the, you know, the, the free care is in the, the purple, the bad debt's in the red, and the combined is in the green. If you look at the trend back from 2012 to today, you see a downward trend. 2000, 
12 and 13, we were almost $5 million in combined bad debt free care. Uh, we're budgeting three point, just under 3.9 next year, a million dollar decrease. Those are on gross charges. So that in includes fee increases over all of those years. So if you factor that in, that downward trend is even more significant. Uh, we put the balance sheet in here. This is, again, is the sheet that comes out of uh, Adaptive. Um, the, the significant change uh, over the years uh, has been in our board designated, which is really our investments. Uh, next year, in the 2019 capital budget plan, we have two significant projects. One, as Tom alluded to, um, we just term it as a behavioral health project, our ER uh, renovation to help better take care of our um, mental health patients when they come in. Right now, they're, the way our ER is set up, it's kind of a, a circle, and we can have those patients in any one of those rooms. There's nothing segregated. Um, we try to have them in some specific rooms, but when they become um, very boisterous and sometimes violent, and you have children coming through there, um, it, it becomes a significant issue, uh, both for our staff and the families and the patients uh, of, of those people that come through. So we put $1.2 million in for that. In our lab, we have a, a lab renovation project. Um, we put $1.5 million. We're looking to pull that out of our investments, not using our, our operational uh, income for that. Cost containment. Um, obviously, like most hospitals, we have to focus on how we control our costs the best we possibly can is to be able to provide the services that we do. Um, over, over the last five years, we've engaged in a, an organization called Premier Labor Benchmarking and Management. The whole idea there is to, is to sort of benchmark ourselves against like hospitals across the country to try to meet both productivity expectations for our staff within the hospital and also costs. When we began this project, we benchmarked us, we were in about the 75th percentile of expense and the 50th percentile uh, of productivity. As an overall organization now, we're almost 50-50, so we've saved probably $2 million in this project over the last five years simply by benchmarking staff and through attrition to try to better align the staff with the services that we have. 340B contract management, we just hired someone to actually really focus on the 340B, the cost of the drugs, how we're implementing it, et cetera. Uh, nursing intern program, I'll let Abel talk about that because that's, that's a pretty interesting thing. So we continue to um, hire nurse interns every year, um, new graduates, uh, usually five to eight a year, depending on the year. We, we really focus in, on hiring folks who have either um, been raised up in our community or have very strong ties to our community so that hopefully retention is a bigger factor. Um, we continue to look at ways of supporting them for about seven months while they're in their new role because evidence base shows that that's um, important for especially new graduates to have that kind of support in order to stay in the nursing workforce. And um, we've been able to retain most of those folks over the last three years. Um, only, I think we've only lost one or two, so that's been a good program. Uh, collaboration with other health organizations. I have a couple of slides coming up on that that I'll get into detail with. Andre, I'm going to let you talk about the New England uh, Alliance for Health Contracting and Supply Chain. Yeah, when we first got into NIA, uh, the New England Alliance for Health, um, it was purely off of the supply chain management and contracting um, goal. We in, since we joined with them, we found that there's many other contracts and services that we were doing that we could actually get reduced pricing for. So we have aggressively, and there's, there's still more out there. Some of the things we've, um, we've moved over, we, we're doing our telehealth through NIA. We're doing our telepharmacy through NIA. Um, we actually have gotten contracts for things as simple as our copiers uh, to be reduced when we run it through the NIA group purchasing. So it's been a very valued uh, move for us, uh, and we've got some un unexpected gains out of it. Um, yeah. uh, facility uh, efficiencies, just something as simple as changing everything over in the organization to LEDs is, is saving significant dollars and is being very energy efficient. If I'm not mistaken, our parking light, our parking lot lights use about 1,000, 900 watts of power. Changing those over to LEDs, it's 100. So those type of small things that we're looking at is really saving money. 
and uh, I think improving efficiency there. Uh, primary care delivery model um, is both cost containment, it's also for uh, population health. <laughs> Uh, several years ago, like most organizations, we had a separate internal medicine group and a separate family practice group with duplicative uh, infrastructures, et cetera. And what we did over the last few years is we've combined those two groups into one primary care. <coughs> and we, is on top of that, we've also developed what's called a team-based model where we align an advanced practice commissioner with a primary care physician and provide them support with a lead nurse for each group. That works as sort of the supervisors of that team. That allows us to take a look at you know, when we look at how a physician or a mid-level is seeing patients, that panel of patients is now looked at from a team perspective, not as an individual perspective. And it's allowed us to hire less physicians and see more patients with those groups working together as a team. Uh, we've already talked uh, at length about Athena Health. Um, so major collaborations. You know, we don't look at our other hospitals in the state as competition. When we look at those other hospitals as partners. Our unique location really makes it, we don't have quote unquote competition. Our only competition is ourselves. If we provide good service and we provide quality outcomes at a reasonable cost for our uh, community, our patients stay in our community, don't want to travel. We have folks that have never left the Northeast Kingdom. We literally have patients that have never been to New Hampshire, never been to Canada. They literally stay in our, in our, in, in our hospital when they require services. So we have to look elsewhere for help and collaboration because we can't do it all ourselves. We can't be everything to everybody alone. Um, so when I look at some of the major uh, collaborations we have, UVM Medical Center, outpatient hemodialysis, uh, nephrology clinic, uh, clinical pathology, we get all our pathology services through UVM, urology. You know, we need urology, but we can't afford a full-time urologist. We contract for two days a month. Uh, neonatal intensive care and transport, we work with UVM. Collaboration with OB clinical quality initiatives. We're also fortunate enough that we can sort of work with Dartmouth as well, so we can sort of help cherry pick some of the services we get for each. So for instance, with Dartmouth, we use cardiology, the stroke and the STEMI collaborations. We currently have a cardiologist who works with us two days a month who's retiring. I've already reached out and worked with Dartmouth to replace that individual with a Dartmouth physician. So they'll be, we're working on a, a, a a recruitment that would be in our organization two days a week. Oncology through the Norris Cotton Cancer Center. Telemedicine, teleneuro, telepsych, and telepharmacy all come through Dartmouth. Uh, and of course, Andre mentioned the, uh, the group purchasing um, Alliance for Health. Other collaborations that we work with, and we work with hospitals outside of Vermont as well. Uh, Northern Counties Healthcare, it's an FQHC in our area. I apologize. Um, you know, we've invested in a dental, a dental clinic in that community down in Orleans where they haven't had dental work, uh, a, de a dentist for years. Uh, Northeast Key and Human Services, the designated mental health agency. Not only do we have a psychiatrist that comes into our clinic once a week, we also have a four day a week nurse practitioner that we contract through uh, that agency. Uh, Northern Vermont Regional Hospital, as we said, with NVRH and St. Johnsbury, we have a limited liability for. Uh, for providing sleep and now uh, pulmonary services. We're actually expanding the LLC in St. J and working on plans right now to do so. Uh, Upper Connecticut Valley Regional Hospital in New Hampshire. Uh, we have a general surgeon, one of our long-standing general surgeons who's retiring, and so it required us to recruit another general surgeon. Well, lo and behold, not knowing that we'd be able to do this, we were able to get a general surgeon before our surgeon retired. So working with the folks over in New Hampshire, they need a general surgeon, we have a general surgeon, so we're sending a general surgeon there once a week. That's gonna save us about $130,000 a year in expenses to offset that cost. Um, Little, Little Tip Regional Hospital. We have a, we have a full-time um, orthopedic surgeon who's come on board in the last uh, six months. Um, we have more volume, per se, in the kingdom that one physician can handle, but we don't need two. So we contract with Littleton for two days a month of an orthopedic surgeon to come up from Littleton. In addition, we have, this is a very busy slide, um, I apologize, um, but um, we have the Upper Northeast Kingdom Community Council, which has the unfortunate acronym of UNIC. And, um, <laughs> but UNIC has been great because our, our vision for it is that all of the groups at the bottom here that are working hard in the community, both within the hospital and on the right-hand side um, through public health, um, are all working on the same goals of the community health needs assessment. 
but we needed a group of folks at, um, in, the, in Munich that were the movers in their different areas of responsibility who were able to um, give forward funds and designate resources to do the work and to help drive the work um, and also be informed by the work that was happening um, in all of the other um, community coalitions that were going on. So UNIX has a grand goal of our next generation whose dreams are community supported is Vermont's healthiest and most successful generation. Um, as Tom said, um, we don't look at other hospitals as competition. We borrowed heavily from NVRH and um, the lower uh, Northeast Kingdom group, all of those folks and what they've been doing with collective impact in their areas and we've seen how they're starting to move the mark on some of their healthcare outcomes. We're pretty excited about that. Um, we're not too different from them, but we do have some distinctions. So we're, we're creating the same kind of group in Munich to do the similar work that they've been doing and hopefully we'll also see some changes and not be last on the list in Vermont. Um, but that, that might take a generation, so don't hold it for the next year. <laughs> Healthcare reform investments, so just a quick slide. Um, you know, we have nothing earth shattering for the 2.4% investment. Uh, as Tom mentioned, our ACO dues have gone up uh, almost $300,000, and we've uh, hired the ACO care coordinator that Tom talked about to help with primary care. And, oops, sorry. Like um, every hospital, we did our community health needs assessment this year um, with gathering qualitative and quantitative data and demographics, looking at what our community said were their highest needs, and we are now focusing um, for the next three years on these five goals. Uh, they're not too unusual. They're not that dissimilar from last year, except for um, the addition of supporting older Vermonters aging in place. What we did do is change how we looked at these. We wanted to make these positive instead of negative. So they're all about supporting substance-free lifestyle and mental wellness, um, supporting tobacco-free lifestyles and healthy eating and physical activities, and access to medical and oral health care. Okay, our capital budget, uh, 6.2 million overall. It's gonna be funded through operating cash flow, which we normally do, and investments, as we talked about earlier, for those two major projects. Uh, there are no items for a certificate of need. And our, our brief list of our significant uh, equipment and facilities replacement, uh, 708,000 for surgical services. Uh, it's time to replace our ultrasound. That's 365, we have two machines. Uh, building management control system. This is something that, uh, this is the brain of our facilities. Uh, most people don't think of uh, a building as, as having any computer attached to it, but this is uh, our computer management of all of our uh, HVAC systems um, in our facility. Uh, telemetry, um, that's come to the uh, to its age to be replaced. You know, my only comment here is, you know, helping Vermont together, and that's true, you can't do this alone, uh, especially based on our location. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Oh, Robin. Thank you. I'm going to get really close to this to make sure I'm not a culprit and not speaking up. Uh, thank you for coming down. I know it's a long drive. Um, I was happy last year when I first came on the board to go visit you, and I'd be happy to do so again in the future. Um, first of all, I, I really appreciate you starting out your presentation grounding us in your population because you do have. Uh, the most challenges of any county or area in the state in terms of your population health uh, headwinds, let's say. Um, I was also happy to see that you had added um, issues around seniors to your community health needs assessment. When I reviewed your Healthy Vermonters 2020 profile, there were two areas that stood out to me related to seniors, which were ED visits related to falls and deaths related to falls. So. Um, I was going to ask you about that and why it wasn't in your community health needs assessment, but I see that that's been updated. So uh, that seems like a, a good addition. Um, I think really my, my one area that I wanted to ask you about uh, specific to your budget, it looked like you had kind of 
a high number of FTEs that you were looking to replace, something like 18, I think, and I wondered if you could speak to that and, and the, if it's realistic to think that you can attract uh, that many new positions in one budget cycle. Yeah, um, and that was a, a question um, throughout the budget process, and, and please, let me clarify with, with what we're looking at. Thank you. It, it's actually not budget to budget. Budget to budget, our FTE growth is just under six. And what Robin's talking about is our what our current projections are of being 21, it's almost 21 FTEs from projection to next year's budget. Those are vacant positions. When you have positions, uh, an FTE that becomes vacant throughout the year, if it's vacant for six months, that becomes a 0.5 FTE in your projection. So um, to be fully staffed at 100% FTEs, I don't think you're going to find any house school that's going to be that way. Um, we did build in some salary lag. We didn't build in any FTE lag, but we did build in salary lag to account for that. The other side of that coin is, with some of our positions that become vacant like that, we have to have somebody there. So that's where the locums come in. So you'll see our locum number actually is, it is probably a little bit higher than the other challenges. The only thing I want to add to that is you remember one of our biggest challenges is recruit, recruitment and, yeah. and maintaining quality staff. Great. Thank you. Um, and I also just lastly wanted to give you kudos in for quality improvement in your APM metrics. Your presentation was very clear in your uh, documents, and that was very helpful. That's all I have. Okay, Tom. Let me get this. Thank you. And like Robin, I was very glad to visit you this year. It's uh, a special part of the world, and the drive up there is very beautiful, maybe a little long, but I enjoyed it going both ways. Um, I'm a force snows. <laughs> I'm a minor, I like to see it. Um, so my questions are um, at, you know, first about um, kind of tying out some of the numbers here and looking at your uh, year over year growth um, in uh, NPR at $4.2 with uh, 2.3 million of that coming out of rate increases, um, both uh, mostly in commercial, obviously, and some in Medicare. So the Medicare, the two I'm most interested in is in the Medicare increase you have um, at 1.2 percent. I'm just wondering how you get to that number. Is, it, is that because have you gone through the critical access <coughs> process and? And you know, you know what that number is. Yeah. So if we if, if our fees actually go up a little bit, we're still getting a, a percent of charge for Medicare. Right. For that special. Do we right. build anything extra into that? Okay. Uh, the one that really caught my eye was the Medicaid increase, which is uh, um, here in the uh, staff analysis at 13.2 percent. Uh, uh, 2019 proposed over uh, 2018. Today, and that seems like a big number to me. I, I see that your dish payment is going up quite a bit, yeah. um, but is is but that, that's still a big number even if you net out the dish number. So, so what is your basis for calculating uh, the, the and, and there's no rate increase associated with Medicaid, so it's all even utilization or um, basically utilization. Um, yeah, it would be you know, the three components would be the utilization, uh, the dish. Our dish went up uh, $450,000, and on $8 million of net, that is a pretty decent percent, um, as well as um, whatever the delta would be from our per member per month uh, amount out of the ACL, which I haven't dove into those to see what the breakdown of those components are. Um, so those are the three components that would fall in that here. Thank you. Um, over here. A question on bad debt. Um, you uh, said to us that you um, uh, that 347,000 about of your bad debt is, is pre 2016 that you're carrying on on your books, um, but that in that of that for that year for 2016 you had just a little over a million dollars in uh, under plan. Um, so I just a technicality here. If, if if you're telling us it's under plan, it's not part of bad debt anymore. Right, so if it's, depending on how you look at 
uh, that what we have is we have payment plans with our um, patients, and we have, as you just stated, a, a large amount. We have we use an outside um, have used an outside um, statement company that helps us manage those plans, and uh, we've got about twice as many patients on payment <coughs> plans as most other hospitals do. We try to do that to help accommodate our patients to be able to pay for their bills uh, over time. All of those patients are religious with their payments. One of the, one of the things we've done in the past is usually from January 1st to April 15th, if they can come up with paying that off, we give them a substantial discount um, on whatever their balance is. So yeah, it's, it's, it's technically, we, we wouldn't consider that as bad, that they're actively paying their plans, so that wouldn't be that bad. And it may be reserved in a, in a reserve because of how we do that, but technically, um, I was just looking at uh, some of the volatility around bad debt, and in 2016, uh, it was 3.46 million actual, 2017, 2.087 million actual, and then it dropped uh, uh, to um, 2018 budget, um, down to a million bucks. And is there that kind of volatility in your bad debt, or? Yeah, when we submitted the budget last year, our bad debt had decreased, and I didn't really have an explanation to that. Um, other than, we, I mean, we've got six navigators at our hospital who do, do a phenomenal job getting our patients uh, enrolled in either Medicaid or on the exchange, or setting them up in those payment plans. Um, so I'm not sure how that bad debt dropped last year. We have seen it come back up this year. Um, and I've been looking into it, I still haven't come up with it as to why that is happening. Okay. But um, over time, you, well, that's why I kind of put that slide up there over the years, we have, right. you know, it shows it going down. So from year to year, it's, it's got a little bit of volatility. So there was a one year that's, one, one year there that you're not, you can't fully really explain, it just yeah. happened. Yeah, it just dropped. Um, in terms of, uh, I, on your utilization page, uh, there are zero travelers noted. Um, so Robin noted some of the staff turnover, and when I was up there, we talked a lot about travelers. Um, so where on your budget page, in, in your budget data, do you carry the information for travelers? So that is that is that something that we can distinctly see as part of your budget? I'll have to look into that to see where, it, if it's broken out specifically somewhere. Um, yeah. Well, right now. I, mean, I, I just noticed in your presentation, you're looking forward to travelers. Yeah, and, and I don't think we put the, the FTE for the travelers in, just the dollars. Yeah. Um, and, and this is a, um, you had uh, on your 340B uh, revenues, you you basically have flatlined them between over 2018 and 2019. Yeah. Even though the trend has been somewhat up over the years. Is that, is it, is it, do you think you peaked out there or what? Yeah, we're starting to see a flatten out. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but Walgreens bought the Rite Aids uh, in the state of Vermont, and that transaction went through in January. We became registered for 340B with Walgreens, effective February 14th. We've still not seen any money come through for that, but all, we're gonna, all I'm anticipating seeing is a shift from the Rite Aid number to the Walgreens number, and from what I've seen, the patients pretty well flattened out, it's pretty saturated. We only have, uh, Three major pharmacies in the area that are associated with um, uh, the 340B now. It's the Kenny Drugs, Red Aid to Walgreens, and then we've seen some uh, migration from Kenny Drugs and Red Aid over to Walmart, which came in a year and a half ago. And uh, finally, in your staff turnover, um, uh, you said you, I think you had like two primary uh, care physicians that have been there for a very long time and they're retiring. Uh, is there any kind of savings uh, uh, from that, or um, is, is it the difficulty of finding replacements in, at your hospital so difficult that uh, what you've been spending is what you have to spend? So we do have an open recruitment right now for a primary care physician to replace uh, those two folks that have retired in the last two years. But when we went to the, when we really delved into primary care, went to that team-based model, we actually had two of our own docs who had retired that we didn't have to replace. But we're seeing such increases in volumes in primary care, as I said, a thousand new patients a year. 
that with those two folks retiring, they're under full recruitment. We've had some great candidates come through. Um, we had uh, two on Friday. We have another one coming in next week. So hopefully we're going to get that position filled. Good luck with that. Thank you. First, I want to compliment you on your um, turnout and financial aid. You know, I think that, especially with debt being down a little bit in NPR this year and still turning, you know, projected to turn a profit after a $2 million loss last year is a good shift. Um, just want to ask a couple questions about the ACL and the reserves, because you talked about reserving on your balance sheet for the risk. And did you roll that through the P&L at all? How are you doing that? And what is that for 18 and 19? Yeah. Um, right now, we reserve every year uh, a certain amount for our uh, Medicare cost report. Uh, we currently have four years of cost <coughs> report outstanding. I'm, and sorry, I'm sorry, four years of what? Cost report. Thank you. Yeah, so they haven't come back to an audit and, and <coughs> close them out uh, for four years' worth. So we have some excess reserves from those prior years that were closed out. So I would use those reserves for this year's ACO reserve. So you're not rolling anything through the P&L as an expense? No. Because you have excess reserves? Correct. And then where are you booking the ACO participation fees? Is that netting out of NPR or do you think that expenses? Uh, that, yeah, it's netting out of NPR. Netting out of NPR. Under the Athena maintenance agreement, um, did you have to write off any capital and stuff you had booked previously that was capital of the <coughs> I'm sorry, that was, I didn't Oh, know. previous, that was capital previously. I know, we've not had to write anything off as far as um, uh, terminating an, an asset before end of life is what you're asking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've not had to write anything off at this point. Most of those are servers that were for our legacy systems, and they've reached their, their light end of life uh, span, per se. So at this point, we haven't had to write anything off. Okay. And when you look at the cost savings from the potential you can get from Athena, and you've already shown that you haven't replaced some of your IT staff, how can you go about that more strategically rather than just through attrition? Look at, you know, what are you going to get for cost savings? How do you reach out to get them? Um, you know, rather, we talked about having retirement or attrition, but unfortunately, it's the people that go aren't always the ones that you need to go. <laughs> You're also right. Um, you know, a, a, a big chunk of savings from an expense perspective that we haven't even talked about, we didn't even put in our slides, is really through the maintenance agreements for the disparate softwares we no longer have. So all scripts, uh, Paragon, which is McKesson, and uh, Medhost, when you're not paying those, those annual or monthly fees, you're going to get significant savings because that's all built into a theme. And with respect to attrition, you know, I, I guess there's several ways to look at it. You know, where we're located, you know, we're not just the healthcare provider for that area, but we're also the center of the economy. And, you know, we have the highest rate of unemployment, so we take very seriously the concept of having to potentially do a layoff or eliminate positions, and we've made those tough decisions over the years. If, if things came to be necessary, you know, to get to a certain point, we would look at that. But we, we average about a 15% turnover in labor per year anyways, and so every single position that comes up as part of that premier benchmarking goes for a resource management team, even for a replacement that either has to be denied or sent forward to the senior team. And so every single position in our organization that's open comes to the senior team for approval. So there are, there are quite a few positions that we can say no to. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Jess. Thank you. So again, I'll awesome congratulate you for the turnaround. And um, thank you actually for adhering to our NPR budget guidance. I don't know, it did flow, right? We tried to follow it. Very much appreciated. <coughs> Um, so one question, you had a slide up there with the APM measures that you're, um, that fall under the threshold and that you're, you know, have some strategies to work towards. One of them that I didn't hear much about was the prevalence of COPD. Are there any strategies to try and uh, address that? And given, you know, at Newport at 10%, the state is at 6%, that seemed a little bit high, so I was wondering if you had just not talked about it. I mean, I... I I think um, the, the biggest thing that we're looking at is um, is all of our efforts around supporting a smoke-free lifestyle. 
and that, uh, or tobacco free, I should say, for all, all uses of tobacco, um, and all of the prevention work that we're doing. And we're looking at some pilot programs, for instance, um, to decrease uh, smoking during pregnancy for, um, or actually eliminate smoking during pregnancy for those who smoke during the pregnancy is a pilot program on that. A lot of other prevention um, efforts with other community members that we're working on towards that, because that's really, I think, because we also have one of the highest rates of smoking in the state. So I think they kind of go hand in hand. Okay. Um, secondly, so we just heard from a hospital about um, the crippling effects of drug costs associated with oncology. Uh, so the critical access hospital that has oncology. And I, I, you know, I'm wondering if you can just speak to the, you know, the collaboration that you have with Dr. Hitchcock and how that may mitigate some of the drug costs that maybe other hospitals may be seeing or how that works. I'd like to hear more about it. So, uh, we no longer offer uh, full oncology services at our hospital. Um, we eliminated that service, uh, I guess it's two years now, a year and a half ago. And at the same time that Dartmouth was going to terminate their relationship at our hospital with the oncology for two reasons. One, the cost of the drugs to us. We were losing significant dollars every year, even with the physicians coming up from Dartmouth. Um, on that program, we only had 30 to 50 patients. And so obviously you're not gaining any efficiencies through volumes. Dartmouth determined that we didn't have enough patients for them to be able to provide the service to us any longer. Um, so we worked specifically with Dartmouth. In St. Johnsbury, which is 40 minutes, 45 minutes from, from Newport, is the Norris uh, Cotton Con uh, Cancer Center. And so all our patients were able to transfer their care to there. In addition to that, for our patients, because we made that difficult decision, uh, we provide gas cards, we provide help the best we possibly can so that they can get back and forth from Newport to, um, to, to uh, St. Johnsburg. Very, very difficult decision, but um, you know, when you're talking about you know, turning things around financially or maintaining a small margin, you know, we are looking at services on a regular basis. And, and unfortunately, with Dartmouth pulling out, it just it wasn't practical for us to continue. Okay, thank you. Um, you are self-insured? Your employees? Yes, for health insurance. Yes. Right. So I'm just wondering if you have considered uh, working with your carrier or your TPA to become attributed through your self-insured employees, having your employees become attributed to one care? Uh, we, have, uh, we have not spoken directly with, uh, with, with our carrier. Um, I do know one care is trying to get them pulled into the ACL. Um, so that's that's a complete discussion right now. Um, so it's under consideration. Yeah, and we had actually talked about that two years ago, <coughs> trying to do it ourselves, but there's some ERISA issues with that, um, which we want to steer clear of, okay. unfortunately. Yeah. Um, my last question is, so you have a new EMR, and this is actually a question about, you know, as we think about integrating healthcare and having all the data being shared and providers access, being able to access patient data across the entire system. Our VHI is incredibly important and having as many patients in the VHI is really important to uh, the working of the entire healthcare system. And so I'm wondering now that you have a new VHR system, um, hospitals can play an important role here in implementing electronic consent through the ADT interface. And I'm wondering if you would be willing, if you're in your budget in this season, to commit resources to help with implementation of that. My understanding is it's about 48 hours of time to get that electronic consent up and running, and but it could have big implications for getting more patients onto the VHI, so. I mean, we consider anything that's gonna help, obviously, the patients. You know, the question for us is, is, is the cost associated with that. One of the reasons we went with Athena, at least, uh, you know, one of the projects that they're working on is having the ability to exchange information with Epic. And so that's one of their future projects to partner with Epic. And being that the two large tertiaries in our area are both going to be on Epic, that was one of the reasons we did choose Athena. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's answering your question specifically. Well, this is about an electronic consent form that would be drilled into the uh, particular oh. aspect of your interface to be able to get patients when they come into to your hospital <laughs> automatically, you know, be asked to consent and have the consent electronically transmitted to Vital yep. to allow their data to be shared with VHI. Yeah, I know we've been electronically connected with Vital uh, for years, and the whole uh, premise with when we go to a state when we went to Athena 
was that would continue and potentially get easier and better. This is specifically about patient consent. This is patient consent. Yes, this is a patient consent. Trying to, we're trying to, the, the oh, state is trying to increase patient consent so that yeah. the patient data is on there. And my understanding is that there is a, a method by which hospitals through their EHR can improve that process by implementing a <coughs> component of their ADT system of their EHR to yeah, yeah. allow that to be easier. So I'm just, we, I, we can, you can get back to me. Yeah, I, I, think think more information. Well, I think from where we all stand is we can make it easier yeah. and electronic. Okay. I'm sorry if I don't know that. I apologize. That's okay. No worries. I, I, it's we'll fine. Down the IT work for me. And right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, they, you know, only two hospitals have done it so far. So I'm trying to find out what the you know, appetite is for the other hospitals. So thank you. Okay, Pat. Do you have questions? I'm all set. Thank you. Okay, great. At this point, we're going to turn it over to the healthcare advocate, Julia and Eric. Okay, can everybody hear me now? Just barely. Okay. I'll try to talk loudly, even though I'm really close to you. <laughs> um, so my name is Julia Shaw. I'm from the Office of Healthcare Advocate at Vermont Legal Aid. Um, our office advocates for Vermonters in healthcare policy, and we also work with individuals who are having problems accessing healthcare. Um, so our office hears regularly from people who are having trouble affording the care that they need. I'm wondering if you agree um, that affording healthcare is a bigger challenge for them. I do think that absolutely, I think not for probably most people, even with insurance, that healthcare is a challenge. Um, you know, I know our insurance plan with our folks are responsible for co-pays, et cetera. So yeah, absolutely it's a challenge. Can you describe um, some of the affordability challenges faced by patients in your service area? Sure. sure. You can talk all day about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we, we, hear, we hear stories like this almost every day. You know, people making choices about, do I buy my medications or do I put food on the table for the children? Do I pay my health care bill or my, my, even if we have a payment plan, do I pay that or do I pay car insurance so that I can get to my job? I mean, it's just constant. The, the family's battles with all the social determinants of health that are going on and all the decisions that they're trying to make, um, it, it's a daily battle. Um, so we've heard hospitals often um, qualify free care as something that's provided to patients who can't pay and that that, that is money owed by patients who could pay but choose not. So I'm wondering if you agree with that characterization. Uh, that's probably pretty accurate. Um, I, I think um, there, there becomes a fine line there um, between whether somebody can pay, is willing to pay or won't pay. Um, and it doesn't matter what their economic status is. Um, so I, I think there's a word of plan. Um, can you tell me how you assess Vermonters' ability to pay when you're setting prices um, for services? We, um, we really don't look at the affordability of somebody able to pay when we set prices, as you probably heard, and we'll hear from all hospitals. A lot of our fee schedules are set off with um, historical uh, rates that go back to old methodology. Um, we have made attempts at uh, reconfiguring some of that, so at least it makes more sense to be in our diagnostic area uh, and our lab area. Um, those are two areas that we constantly hear from patients about um, I tried to, they're, they're expensive tests to have done. Um, so uh, when the board approves a commercial rate for your hospital, do you consider that to be a set rate or a ceiling that you base negotiations off at that point? I consider that as a set rate. Um, so on a different topic, um, can you talk a little bit about the harm reduction services that are available in the area for um, Access to food users, so things like syringe exchange, um, restaurant distribution. Yeah, um, the, the what? Yeah, but, well, I don't think that's necessary. We, we do have we do have in the hospital where where folks can drop off their their used needles, but we don't have a true needle exchange where they get that. Um, but there are um, 
Narcan is available both through the recovery center um, through um, most of our pharmacies with uh, prescriptions by the docs. Um, so there's a lot of that going on. Um, but I don't know if we have a specific program. Which one are you looking for in particular? I was just wondering in general yeah. what kind of harm reduction services you have. So. Yeah, and, and mo most of our harm reduction services are um, linking up with our recovery community. Um, we're very um, focused on prevention and focused on harm reduction um, and, and just the you know, the broad spectrum of where, where folks are on their recovery journey, um, whether it's early or whether it's, you know, they're into it. Um, and do I remember correctly that you are looking at opening an urgent care center? Can you talk a little bit more about that plan and what you need um, your community that's here to meet? So um, we are looking at opening up urgent care, and our hope is that that's going to happen during the year. Um, you know, several reasons why, you know, so we don't have primary care hours after, say, 5.30 at night, and we don't have it on the weekends. Um, so folks are having, ending up having to utilize our emergency department for earaches and sore throats and those type of things. Um, and so obviously we want to try to put folks with those type of, of situations where they should be, and that's an emergent care, at least during the week. And that goes across all lines. That goes commercial, self-pay, you know, Medicaid, Medicare. Um, you know, being that we have such a small, uh, you know, patient base, you know, it always comes down a little bit to finances. And so, if we were to move forward with urgent care, which our plan is to do so, we have board approval to do so. It could very well be a loss needed for the organization, but as a service to the patients and the community, we feel it's necessary to do. But that doesn't mean that would be staffed by. Um providers who are already employed by your organization or would you be recruiting specific staff? To so there? based on our hours of operation that we're thinking, which would basically be, you know, you, you could look at 10 to 12 hours a day, they would ne be necessary to hire at least one or two full-time nurse practitioners if you use a nurse practitioner model or a PA model mm -hmm. versus a physician model, and then supplement that with our own nurse practitioners offering them potentially the ability to work for some extra hours. That's, that's the plan right now. Thank you, that's all the questions. So at this time, we'll open it up to the public for any comments or questions. Dale. Um, Speak very loudly, Dale. Okay. Uh, wow. I got like A, B, C, but I'm going to try to... One is I was reading on med schools <coughs> and the, the way the article read. It was showing concern that new doctors right out of med school or new are not really being trained in how to deliver rural health care, which leads to, one, financially, can they even afford to go there? <coughs> two, I found it interesting from a recruitment point of view of <coughs> Even if you recruit them, they have no idea how to function within that environment. And then you add the social determinants of health, which the article only alluded to as existed, didn't even suggest that they understood that at all. That's one, I want your take on how much of a challenge that is for you. The other one, was similar in that electronic health records don't really measure your 30,000. So your take on whether or not you feel those measurements accurately reflect your challenges and give you meaningful results that actually reflect what's going on in your community. The other one I'm curious about is you said <coughs> nothing is available after 5 p.m. You don't have anything but the emergency room and same on weekends. I thought there was a federal program to actually fund services 
but maybe it's not in rural settings so that you could have a 24 hour care delivery system. I don't know how well it would serve you, but I thought there were funds for that. Well, if there are funds available for that, I'd love to know about it. Um, you know, right now, when we look, we, we, we do an amazing job. So I'm going to start with the third question first. Now. We do an amazing job in North Country to find every penny under every stone we possibly can. Uh, because of where we are in our population and, and you know, what we have for commercial insurance case is just much. So that I can't give you a firm answer to, but we can certainly look at it as part of our urgent care analysis. Um, but right now, I don't know of any program specifically to do that. Okay. Uh, so your first question with respect to rural health. Um, you know, you, you may not believe this, but our, a lot of our docs come to us, our, our primary care docs, because of our rural nature, because of the scope of practice that they can do in our hospital, that we don't have a multitude of specialists that sometimes they can simply send down the chain, that they actually have to provide that care and they have a full service. Not only that, our primary care physicians for the most part work in the hospital as well. So they'll serve shifts as hospitalists, et cetera, and they have to have special training in order to do that. When a new physician comes on board in our primary carrier, they are attached to the medical director and a mentor. And that physician mentor works closely with that individual physician to do their best to make them as successful as possible. It's a, it's a pretty unique program that we've just put into place actually recently and so far it seems to be successful. Um, we also don't put, you know, on a new physician, you know, our expectation is a new physician is going to build a panel of patients over three years. So if an experienced physician is seeing 18 to 20 patients a day, a new physician coming on board, the expectation may be see 10 or 12 patients a day. Just to get the comfort level and uh, basically sort of be able to ramp themselves up. So that's how we do it. And um, it's amazing how many primary care folks want to come to us because of our rural, rural, uh, rural nature. Yeah, I'd like to add to that, um, that we, we also have rotations of med students that come up through our primary care practices. Um, so it's not like they're not exposed to a rural setting. Um, so we do accommodate for that. As well as we probably have 15 or 20 percent of our employed physicians who are from the area. So they know what we're going either from the area or from a rural area. And when they come to us, they, they look for that. And, and I'm sorry, Lee was on the health, the electronic health record. The electronic health records, do they work effectively for you for the population you're working with and reflecting their health care needs? So it's measuring their health care needs, it's giving you relevant data back that tells you about your patient or is it missing a lot of things that you know is going on? Well, you know, I'm going to answer that question yes and no. Uh, you know, the politically correct answer would be that, you know, medical health records are the greatest thing since sliced bread. The, the true answer is that, that it, it can take away some care, but where we were at with our three or four disparate systems, that was definitely uh, uh, had an impact on, you know, our ability to truly get the full story on every patient. Being on the one record, we truly believe and are truly hoping that it is going to give us much more of a sense of each patient's needs and, and will help us provide better care. That, that's our goal. Thank you. Okay, other questions or comments from the public? Okay, seeing none, I'd like to thank the North Country team very much. Um, we'll take a five minute break and invite people from the Northeast to come forward. Thank you. The electronic health records, do they work effectively for you for the population you're working with and reflecting 
their health care needs. So it's measuring their health care needs. It's giving you relevant data back that tells you about your patient or is it missing a lot of things that you know is going on? Well, I, you know, I'm gonna answer that question, yes and no. Uh, you know, the politically correct answer would be that, you know, medical health records are the greatest thing since sliced bread. The, the true answer is that, that it, it can take away some care, but where we were at with our three or four disparate systems, that was definitely uh, uh, had an impact on, you know, our ability to truly get the full story on every patient. Being on the one record, we truly believe and are truly hoping that it is going to give us much more of a sense of each patient's needs and, and will help us provide better care. That, that's our goal. Thank you. Okay, other questions or comments from the public? Okay, seeing none, I'd like to thank the North Country team very much. Um, we'll take a five minute break and invite people from Northeast to come forward. Thank you.